So my name is Victor Silva Aguirre. I'm a postdoc at the Stella Astrophysics Center in Aarhus University. And uh, today I want to tell you a bit about astroseismology and exoplanets, the synergies that we have in this uh, topic, and what we can do today in, the, in combination of these two areas, even without Plato. But it will be exciting anyway. So I know this is probably not the best animation to show after the conference dinner. But um, <laughs> just uh, what you have here is a so-called Kepler Ori and where you have all the exoplanet uh, system, all the transiting exoplanet candidates that, we, that Kepler has found, and just pay attention to the diversity of systems that we have, different sizes, different orbital periods, single system, multiple system. It's really, I mean, it's really a beauty, and for that, I really like it. And what Kepler has given us then is really a zoo of exoplanet and exoplanetary systems to understand, and that's basically why we're here, we want to understand the systems. So first of all, we want to attack as many as possible. And that, I think, Kepler has been extremely successful. Uh, we want to know how they form. We want to know something about their dynamical properties. And I think we've heard many talks about that during the week. We'll, we also want to know about time for orbital circularization. We want to know about obliquities. We want to know about eccentricity evolution and many, many other things that for sure escape my memory right now. But the one thing that I always emphasize is that if we want to know anything about any planetary system, we have to remember that there is a star there and you only know your system as good as you know your star. Um, so just briefly, the detection method is, of course, what you all know, at least from Kepler, is the transit, uh, transiting method. So as you see, the planet transits the star and produces a decrease in the flux that we observe. And this base, very basic picture can give us immediately two interesting observables. So first, you can hear me well like this, yeah. So first, you have a change in the flux between the stellar flux when there's no transit and transit, and that is proportional to the ratio between the planet, the radius of the planet and the radius of the star. And there are two parameters here that you can measure directly from the transit, so this ratio and the flux. So you basically get immediately a measure of the density of the star. So this can be directly obtained from the transit curves, but this is only assuming that the orbit is circular and does not tell you anything about the real size of the planet just learn something about the ratio between the planet and the star. Uh, so the first question regarding density, stellar density, and radius of the planet, how can astroseismology help? And well, I guess the, the answer to this I hope is obvious. So you have seen this picture already many times during the week. Uh, this is the power spectrum of a Kepler star, kick 600, and it's not an exoplanet host node. And you see the pulsation spectra, which has this nine Gaussian envelope with a max frequency of maximum power called, that we call Numax. And the separation between consecutive radial orders of a certain angular degree is what we call the large frequency separation delta nu. And those things we can measure very easily from, for any pulsating main sequence or red giant star, for instance. And the interesting thing is that these two quantities rough relate to the mass and the radius of the star, well, this one to the mean density, for instance. So if you measure this in any Kepler or any oscillating star, and you have a measure of the effective temperature, you get immediately the mass and the radius of the star, and therefore the density, and you can know the radius of your planet. So that is, of course, what astroseismology, the first thing that astroseismology has to offer to exoplanets. So the first results on this, uh, well, as an ensemble, were published for 77 KOIs uh, by Daniel Huen collaborators, and we have more to come. And in that paper, first, I'd like to show you how uh, the difference in the stellar properties that determine effect uh, the planetary system. So what you have here is all the host stars that back then were detected uh, in gray, and in red you have the host stars where we can do seismology for. And here the red lines connect the initial properties that we had from Kik with the properties revised using astroseismic classifications and, and well, in this case, log Gs. So you see that there's really a large change in log G, which of course relates to a change in mass and radius of the star, and therefore you can do a new determination of the planetary radius, because you're measuring the, the ratio between the two. And here I just show you as a function of planet period and planetary radius how this changes with this new determination from astroseismology. So already this is quite clear that you can characterize your planetary system much better if the whole star is pulsating as well. Uh, similarly, of course, you can still determine the transit density, as I showed before, under central assumptions. And you can compare that to the seismic density that we obtain from the pulsations. And at least, well, in this paper, we saw large deviations. They are systematic here to take into account because this was 
only made with long cadence data. So if you do it with short cadence data, you sample this much better. But the, the, the key point behind this is that if you see deviations between the transit density and the seismic density, these are likely related to eccentricities. So you can use this to determine the eccentricity of, the, of, your, of your exoplanet just by comparing these two densities. And uh, there will be a talk about it right after mine by Vincent uh, Van Leiden. Um, so, as I said, the, these scaling relations where we can determine mass or radius are extremely powerful for characterizing exoplanet systems. But ages, they still have very large uncertainties. And that's something that we really want to know. We want to know how old our planets are and how they compare in the solar nebula or beyond. So the question, of course, arises, how can we do this better? And can our seismology help for this? And I mean, the power spectrum that I showed before shows a lot of different modes. So there's much more information in it than just this delta nu and this nu max value. So the, this is just a sketch of the interior of a star where you have these pulsation modes that bounce in the surface and travel to the interior and bounce again back. So different angular degrees and different frequencies, they probe different regions of the star. And they tell us about the interior structure. So we can exploit this information. We can use individual frequencies and we can use combinations of frequencies to probe different regions of the stellar interior because they propagate to the different depth and they depend on the stellar structure. So using this kind of techniques, we can actually probe the core and therefore determine the age of the star. It, as, as a very nice example that just came out of, of this Koro, Koro exoplanet, whole star 655, uh, just, just want to draw your attention to these two uh, regimes here. So this is the mass determined from different methods for the exoplanet whole star. And this method one is what you get normally when you have, say, temperature, lu uh, luminosity, and metallicity. You put that on top of isochrones, and you get those stellar parameters out. This is roughly the range that you get for the mass determination when you use different combinations of input physics. And this is the best one that you can get with the seismology for the mass. So this is a huge improvement that you can do thanks to the pulsations. And similarly for the age, in the same paper, they showed for different methods. I mean, determination from calcium-2 or from the lithium lithium depletion, gyrochronology, etc. I mean, the error bars in this case are huge. This is the normal HR diagram inversion. So again, when you have temperature, metallicity, and log G or something like that, and you try to determine the age, and this is the best seismic age that you can get. So we can really, really do much better with seismology than with traditional methods. Um, so with this in mind, uh, we started uh, roughly a year ago what we call the CAGES project, so the ages of exoplanet whole star of KOIs. And what we're doing here is we have 33 KOIs where we have individual frequencies determined. So these are the brightest and the best KOIs that we have. And we have, since we extract these individual frequencies, we can, we're trying to do a robust determination of masses and ages and use this as a benchmark sample for large exoplanet studies where you don't have this type of data. So just want to briefly show you the results that we're obtaining. So this is the mass distribution of, um, of the exoplanet whole stars that we have. Nothing particular to see here in terms of shape. This is a highly biased sample, but just want you to notice that we are spanning a massive range of main sequence stars between roughly 0.75 and 1.6 solar masses. For the same reason, we're spanning a large range in age, so very young stars between two giga years and very old systems. And just to give you a, just a reminder that the sun is there, so one solar mass in 4.6 giga years, and we're spanning on both sides. I mean, we have exoplanet systems which are much older than the sun, and I think that's pretty exciting and very interesting. I mean, more twice the, twice the age of our, of our solar system. Uh, so what we expect to get from this is, well, radio with an accuracy of 3%, and for these KOIs, masses to 8%, and ages to around 15%. Uh, and this sample is roughly spanning distances from 100 to 500 parsecs from us. Um, and one of the very special, special objects that we found among this sample is this KOI3158 that Tiago Campante spoke about. Uh, on Monday, and this star is the, I mean, it's the oldest known host of terrestrial sized planets. It's five compact objects, and the astroseismic age that we determine for this star is 11.23 giga years. That's the oldest one that we know so far. And this was only possible, of course, thanks to seismology. Uh, so, radii and density, we can definitely do better. Masses and ages, we can definitely do better. Uh, but I just want to shift gears and go into a topic that has come out. Uh, several times during this conference, this is the architecture of the exoplanet systems. Uh, okay, I'm not a very clever guy, and I always get confused with this, so I thought I should put a picture, and I will try to walk you through it. So, say that we have a, uh, our star, and we are looking, this is the line of sight, so we're looking from there. 
the angular the, that we have there, this I star, is just the inclination angle of the spin axis of the star with respect to the line of sight. And here you have the, well, the orbit of the planet is transiting there, so this is the <laughs> vector which is perpendicular to the orbit, and this, therefore, between the line of sight of and, the, um, and, that, and the angular momentum vector is the planetary, is a planetary angle. And what you have here is the obliquity of the system, so the angle between the two, the spin rotation axis of the star and the angular momentum vector of the orbit. And this guy, you can measure from the transit, okay? But, so in principle, if you have a measure of the stellar inclination angle, you will get a measure of the obliquity, the true obliquity. But the system, there's no, it doesn't have, to, you don't know if it's pointing directly towards you or not, so it can be tilted to the side. And for that, you need to measure the projected obliquity, which is this, this angle here, if you want to reconstruct the full 3D orbit of the planet, okay? Um, so what you need first is a measure of the, true oblique, the projected obliquity in order to reconstruct everything. And this we have seen already during the week, right? The, this can be done with the rossiter mclaughlin effect, which basically when the, plan, when the planet is transiting in different directions, I mean crossing the stellar disk in different positions, you get a, a different shape of the radar velocity curve because of covering blue shift or red shift parts of the star. And you measure different projected inclination angles, which in this example, zero, 30, and 60. So this you can do from the ground. Uh, so what you want to do, what you want to measure is really the true obliquity because that tells you something about the formation and the interaction throughout their life of these exoplanet systems. Uh, so, but for that, you also need the stellar inclination angle. And this between, it's really difficult to measure. You can do it with rotation period, this and I, but that's not easy. But luckily, stars pulsate. And when they pulse it, the multiplate split, and that carries information of the stellar inclination angle towards the line of sight. Just here in this example for two, this is an L equal one mode, and here you see the multiplates at four different angles of inclination, 30 and 80 degrees. The multiplates are split and change their amplitudes. Uh, there's a beautiful animation that Andrea Milio did to show this, so before I play it, just to tell you, these are the three components. The M, the M0 and the plus minus of the, of the L equal one modes. And these are the relative amplitudes of each one of these modes. And this, well, when the animation starts, you will see the star will begin to rotate and then it will start to change its inclination angle. And the amplitudes, the relative amplitudes will change. I hope it works, yes. So you see the program in the retrograde mode and then the inclination is changing and you see that the amplitude of the central mode increases and the one of the side, and the side modes decrease. So if you, if you detect this and you measure the relative amplitudes, you can immediately tell the inclination angle of the star. That's how we do it in seismology, basically. Until you end up, if the star is pointing towards you, you only have the central mode. Uh, so this has been done already for a few systems. So Kepler 50 and Kepler 65, published by Bill Chaplin. Um, so where we measure uh, rotation, I mean, this, the inclination angle was basically equator on almost 90 degrees, and well, Vincent Van Hylen will speak about Kepler 410, which is a different system, but this has been done already with Kepler data. In uh, another beautiful example, I think is Kepler 56 by Daniel Hoover last year, where you basically have, here's the line of sight, and you have two planets which are aligned with the line of sight, two inner planets, but the stellar spin uh, axis is inclined and there's a detection of a third companion in a wider orbit that might have produced this misalignment somehow, some sort of cosi cycle, or we have heard about that. But then we have two misaligned gas giants which are in long periods of 10 and 20 days. And then I started thinking, well, I've been hearing a lot about misaligned hot Jupiters in this conference, and this is a system that is completely different from this. So we have seen this like 20 times, but I couldn't help myself of showing it. <laughs> this is, I think, is the plot of the conference, right? So we have the projected obliquity, so this lambda angle that I showed before, as a function of effective temperature. And just to remind you, stars which are hotter than roughly 6,200 kelvins or so, they show higher projected obliquities that the stars that are cooler. And this is what uh, Simon Albert, he's one of the people who has been working on this, not the only one, but this plot comes from that paper. And the other interesting thing that I think Simon did there is that he correlated this with Visanar of the star. So as expected, you see that the, the hottest stars, the, the Vs and Nas, so they're rotating faster, and then there's a clearly a dependence on Vs and I of this trend. And what, what is that? In that, in that uh, paper, they interpret this as a result of evolution, of stellar evolution. So what you have here is the projected obliquity as a function of age. 
and you see that the stars which are misaligned are younger and the stars which are aligned are older well, on average. You basically see this trend. So what they argue is that does the change in stellar structure with they drive the realignment? I mean, that was the working hypothesis of that paper. And I just, just looking at this plot, you stellar, I mean, people working in stellar structure, they know that this is the craft break that Jen Van Seders told us about last week, I mean, sorry, last week, yesterday. And stars on this side don't spin down, or very mildly, and stars on, on this side, they do, with their evolution. So this uh, trend, which is, seems to be with age, I don't think it's really related to actually the age of the system, but rotation is probably the answer, and I think work should probably go in that way. And that is basically what the talks of Massa and Van Seders presented yesterday. So the craft rate is there, and it's obvious. Uh, and I think for the same reason, the cages sample, which I spoke about before, were very interesting just to use these ages to calibrate larger samples again and see if there's any dependence on age with this, um, with this inclination angle. Um, so just want to briefly mention one last interesting system, which is here, at basically two giga years, and this is HAT-P7, and uses this technique. They have been now obliquity measurements and since, since there is Rosita laughing effect measured for this star from the ground, you can get the full 3D solution, I think, for the first time for a, for a star using both seismology and ground-based data. And what they found is that the, there is evidence that the, that the orbit of this planet is quite likely retrograde. And uh, Otman Benomar will speak now and will actually present his results on this system and also in Kepler-25. Um, so just a summary of my talk. I think there's clearly a very virtuous circle between seismology and exoplanets. Uh, we can determine densities, we can determine radia, masses, uh, and ages, and that can definitely aid the characterization of exoplanets. We are now working on these 33 stars where we will get ages. 77 have been analyzed already, and we're working now on extending the sample to over 100, hopefully. Uh, we are aiming for accurate masses, radia, and ages. Accurate is a big word. Maybe we should speak about precision. That's a different discussion. And of course, we want to facilitate studies of planetary formation and evolution. And for this reason, I think the future looks very bright. We have K2, we have Tess and Plato coming, and this is really going to be exciting in the years to come. Um, before I finish, just want to make a little announcement. We are also hiring, uh, and we are not hiring Mar Martin Steele, <laughs> if you were wondering. Uh, so we are hiring, we're looking for a postdoc in theoretical stellar physics in Aarhus University for a three-year period. Application deadline is October the 1st, and if you haven't, I mean, the announcement will be made, I think, this week, if Hans sends the email, yes. And um, if you have any questions, once you get the announcement or anything, just please contact Hans, his email is there. And looking forward to see you all in Aarhus in a year from now. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. We have plenty of time for discussion. I want to pick up on questions. So, do we? Uh, can you show the diagram of obliquity versus uh, V sine I? Uh, that, it was? Mm -hmm. that one, yeah. Good one? Yeah. Are you saying, are you telling me that those two plots are independent of each other? I mean, what I'm saying is, are you telling me that the projected obliquity? is independent of V sin I, because to me, those look as if they're highly correlated. I, no, I didn't say that. What I'm saying is, you measure the projected obliquity yeah. using the, uh, this effect, the yes. Rossiter effect, or what it's called. OK? So that's an independent measurement. Yes. Independent of, of what V sin I is. It doesn't matter what the V sin I of the yes. star is. Mm -hmm. OK? Yes. What to, me, to me, these two diagrams look so similar. That's precisely why I think that the reason why this misaligned system occurs has to do with rotation. Well, I think, I think that there's something wrong with measurements of projected obliquity. Sorry? My conclusion would be the opposite. Which? That there's something wrong with how you measure the obliquity. That's, uh, I mean, one, for instance, a had p 7 system has, I think, three or four different measurements of uh, the projected obliquity, and they don't agree. So, could well be. I mean, that's a different topic, yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that the, when you have a difference in the stellar mean stellar density deduced from transit light curve mm -hmm. and the density from seismology, that implies that the 
planet's orbit is eccentric. But if you look at the curve, if you recall the curve you have, the plot you have, the discrepancy is in both directions, apparently. I, okay, I, right. I just, I right. want to emphasize right. this. Right here, both sides they have. Sure, I want to emphasize what's happening? this is not due to eccentricity, okay? The method can use for this, but the data used for this plot was long cadence. So you really need to sample the transit properly to get a very good measurement of the transit density, and then you can compare these two and see if there's a disagreement. I just showed this plot for illustration, okay, of the method, but this should be taken with caution. The dots, the points are the, um, the below the lines, okay? Yes, but that's exactly, I mean, there's a, the, in the paper there is a plot right below that shows the ratio of the density as a function of impact parameter. And you see that there's a correlation in the difference of densities with this, so there is something to t still take a look at in the measurement of the density from the transit, okay? So this is, I'm not saying that this is eccentricity, I'm just saying the method can be used to measure that. Yeah. Hi, I've at last been given a, an excuse for raising scaling relationships. <laughs> that you use them as though they are exact. Well. And they're at best statistical relations. Yes, I, right. I completely And so agree. the errors that you should put on these are the errors at least from the statistical uh, what so what we're currently trying to do is use the koi the 33 good stars that we have where we have individual frequencies and we can use combinations and other methods to calibrate the scaling relations and see how good they hold but uh, calibrate no. means also with errors sorry also with errors yes. and Absolutely. with errors on how you determine new max and and, delta nu. and large separation per given star from the observations and from the models, yeah. yes, absolutely. Which is much larger than yes. what yes. absolutely. Tim? I just wanted to pick up Anne's point. I agree that we have to be very careful using these relations, and I'm glad that Victor has approximate signs there. But I don't understand what Ian meant by that they're statistical. I think the problem is there may be biases in systematics. Um, I don't understand what you mean by saying they're statistical relations. These relationships you get by plotting, if you can, not the many stars, uh, large separations against other estimates of mass and radius or new max against uh, basically large separation. You say there's a straight line. There isn't a straight line. There's a best fit straight line to this data with scatter around it. Because right, the large separation of a star is not uh, exactly proportional to its mean density by any stretch of imagination. Right? If you just do it with sets of models, you find variations of, uh, of the order of 5%, can be even up to 20%, but for ordinary reasonable stars, about 5%. I, um, I, will, I will actually argue for the statistical errors that we haven't done the test of the results that we get using different methods, just using different fitting methods, for instance, for grids. And that I, and that I will be careful of as well. So you do correlation? Yeah. Hello, I just want to mention or line out that we also cannot fully trust the inclination from rotational splittings. The, um, there are a couple of assumptions in there that will introduce a scatter uh, up to 10 degrees. So it's, you basically you only know the inclination yeah, yeah. Uh, very well if you have eclipses. So that but is one thing. But that's precisely why we do this full analysis and what, what we get is a certain probability distribution function and then we can yeah. give a median and a certain error bar. That's, uh, yeah, that's any final? Uh, yeah. Cool. That's for you. Mikkel, you can run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for a really nice talk. Um, going back to the plot with the two densities, that could also mean if there is a, a difference between the two values that your target is a false positive. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's why, that's why I said please with care, it's just to explain the method, not, not take at face value. And in the paper, this is clearly explained as well. Okay. Let's thank Victor again.